Well, it's appropriate this morning that we are dealing with the attributes of God, and specifically this morning we're dealing with the goodness of God. If you'd like to follow along in your Bibles, uh, these fine gentlemen would love to place one in your hand. Slip up your hand, they'll make sure that you receive a Bible here today. Just want to give you a word of encouragement for next weekend. Next weekend when you come, uh, this building will be full of sound, <laughs> full of sound. Uh, if you were here last uh, year, or last summer when we had uh, King's Brass here, uh, it's amazing, uh, the, the ce- the, just the celebration of, of uh, the gifts of God in their life, just using these instruments, uh, the brass just fills this auditorium up uh, with tremendous, tremendous sound, and it is just a, a fabulous, fabulous experience. So we have the blessing of having them here on a Saturday night. We are hoping to, to fill this auditorium, and so uh, just a word of encouragement, come, be blessed, uh, invite people to come with you. Uh, you need to go online and register, it's true, but the tickets, there's, there's no real tickets where you've got to pay money, um, so just go on and do that, and if it's last minute, just come anyway. Um, look, we just really are excited about next Sunday, because next Sunday they will be here, and they will be doing a mini concert during the morning service, and so that's unusual. I, all the times that we've had them over the years, we've never had them for a Sunday morning, Generally, a Sunday morning is reserved for churches of thousands of people. And so we are very, very blessed to be able to, to have them come and be a part not only a Saturday night, but a Sunday as well. So enjoy the, the uniqueness of this situation is what I'm saying. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring people out next Sunday, um, neighbors, friends, coworkers, etc., who may not know the Lord and then build an evangelistic service uh, around the music and uh, the presentation of the gospel. So uh, we have a target. That's our goal. Uh, You will determine whether or not that's going to be successful or not based upon uh, your ability to to invite folks out um, to come and, and to be a part of that. So that's next Sunday. Uh, be excited about it. You ought to be excited about it. You ought to be all revved up about it. Uh, I'm fired up about it and uh, looking forward to it. And then Sunday afternoon after that service, I'll be zipping to the airport. So uh, <laughs> it'll, be, uh, it'll be an exciting day for sure. That is absolutely true. Well, this morning we are dealing with the goodness of God, and uh, there are so many places in Scripture that talk about the goodness of God. It's a very relevant subject for us today. Uh, Last Sunday, who can tell me what we talked about? Talked about the power of God, that's right. Uh, The power of God uh, is the starting place, I believe, as you go through a study on the attributes of God. Uh, It's... um, interesting as you seek to try to put these attributes together how you do it Uh, because last Sunday as we looked at the omnipotence of God or the power of God uh, we then come to the goodness of God and the message that will follow the goodness of God will actually be the wisdom of God and what we're trying to do is understand that if God is all-powerful how does that really factor into our lives Last Sunday, we talked about the power of God, and as demonstrated in the Old Testament through the creation, and then secondly, through the exodus. And those are the two main demonstrations of the power of God that would come first to the Jewish mind. So that the Jewish person would say, yes, we recall the creation, and we recall the amazing exodus. And so that was the underlying foundation of it. When you talk about the goodness of God, there is obviously a tension here. Does everybody feel the tension? You say, well, I don't feel any tension. There is tension. Because if God is so powerful, and as he said, there is nothing that's too difficult for me, you know the question, why does he allow evil to exist in this world? What about, and I've been asked this many times, what about Hurricane Katrina? What about terrorism? What about some of the things that we just saw recently on the news where people have suffered? If God is all-powerful, why does not he reconcile this with his goodness and cause all of this evil and all of the pain and all of the suffering to go away? It's a good question, isn't it? And in light of the power of God, the question then is, can God truly, truly be good? Let's look to the Lord, our good God, in prayer. 
Father, we thank you that we can come before you and ask these questions. Help us, Father, to search the scriptures this morning and find the answers. That we would walk away from here, Lord, emboldened in our faith, loving you more than when we came in. Because truly, Lord, there is no one like you. And we're blessed to know you. And I pray your blessing on this message now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the scriptures go on and on and talk about the goodness of God. That's one that we'll get to here in a moment. Psalms chapter 107 and verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is, his loving kindness is everlasting. Psalm 31, 19, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast stored up for those who fear thee, which thou hast wrought for those who take refuge in thee before the sons of men. Even Hosea gets into the act. Hosea says, afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. The importance of the goodness of God is absolutely, without question, paramount in our study. When you go to the very beginning of the Bible and you go to Genesis, and Genesis, the creation is unfolding, and we spent some time talking about this last week, but we talked about when God got through creating different, on different days, the aspects, and God said it was, and he gets to the very end of it all, and he says it is very good. And so you have that unfolding. Early on, God has created Adam, and God looked at Adam, and he said it was not good that he was alone. When Adam and Eve come together, they're walking through the garden, and the Bible is going to give the account of the temptation. We'll end the message with that in Genesis chapter 3. But there was a tree that God had created of good and evil. Good and evil. All through the early parts of Genesis, you have this issue of goodness and you have this issue of evil. And truly, there is only one who is truly good, and that one alone is God. Psalm chapter 16 and verse 2 says, And I said to the Lord, Thou art my Lord, I have no good besides thee. There is no one who is good apart from God. The goodness of God is truly the sum total of all of his attributes. When you stop and you consider his power and his wisdom and all of these things, it all mounts up underneath the goodness of our God. Is God good? I believe the scriptures are very, very clear that God is indeed good. He is a good good God. The Bible teaches that there is without question uh, the reality that he is the originator of all that is good. James chapter 1 verse 17 says every good thing, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. Psalm 84, 11 says, the Lord God is a sun and shield and the Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God is a good God. When it comes to our eternal destination and our destiny before him, it is going to be determined by his decision as to how one can truly be good in his sight. Our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of the Lord. God who is holy, God who is good, there is no one like him. He is is by necessity good so that in him we determine what is evil and we determine that there is only one truly good thing and that is God himself. He is there in heaven and we have no way outside of Jesus Christ to spend eternity with him in heaven. Because there is nothing below that is good that is not from his hand. And so what God has done is he's given to us Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has come. He's taken upon himself your sin. And he took upon that sin and he died on the cross of Calvary. 
And it is only when we are able to say by faith we have placed our faith in Jesus and we are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ that that we can go now into the presence of our good God. And so God alone is good. Do you believe that God truly is good? The goodness of God is a variable in the eyes of many people. You know this verse well, don't you? It's a great verse. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. How many are familiar with that verse? Okay, most of you are familiar with that verse. That's cool. But when you think about the goodness of God, oftentimes the goodness of God is based upon your perspective. You have a perspective that is no doubt conditioned by experiences. And if you're here today and life is going great, you might look at it and say, God is good. God is good. In the God's Not Dead movie, what was it? God's not, God is good. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And they go back and forth, right? But so much of it is dependent upon the conditions of our life, is it not? Oh, I've got a job. I have food on the table. It's a long weekend. I've got vacation coming up. I have my health. I've got what I need. God is good. But the perspective in life may be challenged by the circumstances that intersect our pathways. First person I want to look at this morning is Job. If you take your Bible, go back to the Old Testament, go back to Job. It's just right there before Psalms. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, pastor, we're going to Job. (laughs) Poor guy. Always gets beat up. Here you are, you know. In Job chapter 29 and verse 1, Job again took up his discourse and he says this Oh, that I were as in months gone by, as in the days when God watched over me. The perspective of Job is an interesting perspective because as we know, Job is stripped away of his loved ones, he's stripped away of his health, he's stripped away of his wealth, he has all of these things taken from him, and he is under incredible pressure now to see that God is still good. And he pines for the days when things were as they were. Have you ever pined for the days and wish things were as they were? Notice what Job says. He says, I wish things were like it were months gone by, as in the days when God watched over me. When his lamp shone over my head and by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in the prime of my days, when the friendship of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me and my children were around me, when my steps were bathed in butter. Don't you love the expressions there? When my life was basically smooth. I have to tell you, I felt that way yesterday. And I wish that things were like they were some years ago. Karen and I visited the cemetery where our daughter's buried. And we have loved ones that are there in the ground. And I can't deny the fact that I thought, oh, I wish it were like it was several years ago. Job had come to a place here in chapter 29 where his mourning for days gone by and for his children is very understandable. It's uh, natural, and I would expect nothing less. It's not wrong. 
Where Job's error in thinking at this point comes is in the thinking that God has forsaken him. Where is, where is God? Chapter 31 and verse 4, he says, you know, why isn't God still watching over me? Why, you know, and, and he before that is recounting his, his good walk with God, his, his, his own morality and his own dedication to the Lord. And he says, why is God not watching over me anymore? You see, the temptation for Job in his perspective was under fire because he was looking at it from the standpoint that maybe God has abandoned me. Have you ever felt that way? You see, if you encounter these types of difficulties, this will be a progression of thought that is very normal in in the hearts and minds of people. Where is God in all of my suffering? And if he's omnipotent, if he's all-powerful, why isn't he correcting this situation? Man, I remember when my life bathed in butter. Job comes to the end of it all, and he's like, well, I'm done talking. I'm putting my hand over my mouth. I'm all done. God, I'm just having faith in you. And his perspective, even through his suffering, doesn't change, he still believes God is good. Take your Bible and go with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, I want to show you another person who has some affliction, some tension in his life that would bring him to the point where where he may say to himself, you know, the reality is, um, you know, I have a complaint Job's understanding of God's perspective, what is he going to do? Is he going to blame God? That was the question. And the apostle Paul, he's going to blame Satan. He can look at Satan and say, I've been afflicted. I want you to see here in chapter 12 uh, of 2 Corinthians, uh, a book, incidentally, that we'll be going through in its entirety starting in the fall. But he says this, boasting is necessary, verse 1, though it's not profitable, for I'll go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, out of the body, I don't know, God knows such a man was caught up into the third heaven. Who's he talking about? Himself. And I know how such a man, and he goes on, he talks about it, was caught up, verse four, into paradise, and he heard there inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I'll not boast except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do not For if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I'll be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. So the Apostle Paul, get this straight, has gone and he has witnessed things that have never been seen before by a mortal man, a believer, a member of the body of Christ. Can you imagine with me, there is a member of the body of Christ who went to heaven and checked it all out before he died physically. Pretty impressive, isn't it? And remember, this is 14 years prior to this. This means he's written Revelations, or uh, Romans rather, since then, and there's a lot that's been going on. This is pretty exciting stuff. And here he is, the Apostle Paul. Uh, What an event that must have been. How many would line up if after the service, Jesus would just take us up to heaven for a couple of hours to see what it was all about? That's right. We'd have a line of people, wouldn't we? We'd have a line of people. Now, let me ask you this. How many would do it if you knew that you were going to be afflicted physically afterwards? <laughs> I have a couple people raising their hand. Look at what happens to the Apostle Paul. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, this is the things that he saw in heaven, he says this, because of this, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself. <laughs> hey, do you ever, you ever have knowledge that you're privy to that nobody else knows about? Not very often, right? I know me either. Um, but, but, but imagine, I mean, I mean you know, you, you say, wow, yeah, you know, uh, hey, uh, you know, I've been to Ocean City. Really? Have you Really? I mean, that's pretty cool, right? I mean, you know, how many have never been to Ocean City? I mean, 
half of you, right? Or, well, maybe not. But it's like, wow, okay. Um, how many of you have been to, to Hawaii? How many of you have seen the Arizona? Yes, woo, see, you can get it over on me. I've, I've never seen the Arizona. He said, oh, yeah, Kevin, oh, you should have seen that. Unbelievable. And, and for Paul, he comes back from heaven, and he says to the church, listen, you guys want to know what it's about up there? Right? His pride could have gotten the best of him. And so because of this, God allows this affliction to come into his life. I want you to see that they're totally linked together. Because oftentimes we talk about the thorn in the flesh that Paul had, and we fail to link it to the scenario that, that preceded it and is the reason for it. He says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And the thorn in the flesh has a purpose, and that's to keep him from exalting himself. So it was very well designed. Now understand this, for the Apostle Paul, why do I have to experience all of this? And so for the rest of his life, he is going to deal with a thorn in the flesh. And for time this morning, we're not going to conjecture about what that thorn in the flesh even is. But understand this, that in some way, that thorn in the flesh humbled him. It humbled him. And he failed to exalt himself. In verse 10, it says, therefore, he says, I'm well content with weaknesses. Weaknesses now he's talking about in his body. I'm hearing insults about my weaknesses, perhaps. He says, uh, I'm in distresses. I'm dealing with persecution and other difficulties that he doesn't even enumerate. And he says, for Christ's sake, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm experiencing this. And he says, when I'm weak, he says, in reality, it's at that point that I'm strong. When I'm not exalting myself, he says, I'm strong because the grace of God is sufficient for power and it's completed in weaknesses like Paul was experiencing. Imagine the pressure that Paul was under when he had to stop and think about the goodness of God. Paul never complains. He never really talks about the denial. Instead, he flips it around in verse 10, and he says, this is actually a positive thing. And he was blessed to be able to experience that amazing time in heaven. Now, how many, if you knew you were going to be afflicted and bear this thorn in the flesh, would line up after the service to go up there to heaven for a little while? Not very many, only four or five. The line's going to be short. That's good. I'm in that line. You say, well, why would you get in that line? Because when you're strong, you're not exalting yourself. So there was a meaning that was very significant in the thorn of the flesh. In fact, if I said to you, you're going to forego the trip of a lifetime, you're not going to see heaven at all. How many would line up to say, I'll take that thorn in the flesh so that I can say what Paul said? You see, Paul's perspective was under pressure, but he didn't waver. He still sees that God is good. Can I ask you a question? Remember the verse I put up there, Romans 8, 28? Who wrote that? Paul. Paul wrote that after he had been afflicted. He looked at it and he said, all things are working together for good. A third man's perspective is that in the Old Testament, take your Bible and turn with me to Genesis chapter 50. Joseph had an understanding of God's, had an understanding here as well. And, and when you look at his uh, desire to understand God's perspective, it would be easy for him to blame people. Oftentimes when we go through these types of situations, it's very easy for us to point the finger and, and blame someone and something or try to establish some culpability. But in Joshua's life, or Joseph's life, rather, Joseph has a very interesting life, doesn't he? Uh, Joseph is a character. Uh, you know, the coat of many colors and all of that, but you remember when his brethren uh, decided they could live without him? 
And the Bible says that they had murder in their heart toward him, and then they changed their mind and sold him into slavery. Now, here's a young man who's trying to do the right thing, trying to be a tool in God's hand, and he ends up being sold into slavery, into Egypt. How many would think that that is something that's fair for this young man? Well, it's not fair, is it? He gets in there, and you find that uh, he's starting to work his way on up through. He's working for a man named Potiphar. Do you remember Potiphar in the Old Testament there? Potiphar is a great guy and loved uh, Joseph. Uh, but Potiphar's wife was a little, uh, yeah, she was a little astray, I would say, and decided that she wanted to have a relationship, a physical relationship with Joseph. What was Joseph going to do? He's a man, he's far away from home. There's no one there who even knows him. There's people that probably don't even know his heritage. You know, here's this, this Jew living among the Egyptians and how easy it would have been for him as a young man to uh, have a relationship with this other man's wife. But what does he do? He runs from that sin, doesn't he? Provides us a great example in scripture that's been taught over and over again of the importance of fleeing those types of youthful lusts. Where does it get him? Thrown into prison. She brings accusations against him and you know how that goes and uh, it's in the paper before you know it and he's in prison. Right? I mean, this is terrible what's going on. And there he is, he's in prison, and there's these dreams that, that, that the Pharaoh's having, and who's going to interpret them, and so forth. And you remember the, the situation. Uh, eventually, he helps out the cupbearer uh, and the baker, and, and uh, the cupbearer lives, and does he remember Joseph and get him out? No. And so he sits there rotting in prison. You've got to be thinking to yourself, if you're him, you know, th th life is really dealt me a bad hand you know I mean here I am in prison I should be out of prison I mean God directed my ability to interpret that dream why am I still in jail I should be the one who's out I did the right thing and and not uh, lying with that man's wife I, I I should be rewarded for that well where's the reward where's the good things that need to happen it would have been very easy for him to become bitter wouldn't it well, at the end, you know what happens. God uh, allows another dream to come into play, and somebody does remember old Joseph, and he's there on the spot. God gives him wisdom, and the next thing you know, he's out, and he's half running the place. You know what I mean? And he has got so much wisdom. There's a wonderful time of bountiful harvest. I mean, what do you do with all this grain? I mean, what do you do with it? And he, in his wisdom, thought, you know, we'll save this up for a rainy day. And the rainy day comes, and there's seven years of famine, and it's just not famine in that particular geographical area, but it's very broad. And so the Bible says that all the people of the world basically were coming to Egypt so that they could get uh, provisions there and buy this food because uh, of this man, Joseph, who was so wise and laid up all of this food. And don't you know that in the whole process of these people coming to get food, here comes his brothers. Now, you talk about payback, but we're talking about a great opportunity here for some serious payback. Genesis chapter 50, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back? Whew. Could you imagine their faces when they realized that the man in charge of it all was their brother, the same one they wanted to kill, the one they sold into slavery? Well, to Joseph's credit, Joseph could see the end and distinguish what God was doing. In verse 19, it says there, Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for I am in God's place. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Wow. God who is good saw the beginning from the end. Knew that in fact this was an opportunity for Joseph to be in the exact place that God wanted him to be. He says there, do not be afraid for am I in God's place? Am I not exactly where God wants me to be? For this determined purpose, God has placed me here. 
and he understands that. He doesn't question the goodness of God, but he realizes that throughout the difficulties, God was moving to bring all of this together. I would submit to you that God is good all the time despite the circumstances of life. Whether you're Job, you've had it all taken away. Whether you're Paul and you've been afflicted now for many, many, many years. Whether you're Joseph, you've been in and out of prison all the while. You've been upright and before the Lord. God is still good. And he's still good all the time. Karen and I went, uh, well, several years ago, we went down to Myrtle Beach to be with our son who was going for a... Uh, consultation with his cancer doctors. He's gone through his treatment at this point in time. He's only 20 some years old, 25 maybe, four, 24. And uh, he'd been working for a company for a little while and um, there was a kind of this huge promotion that was available for him and uh, it, it was like a home run and secular work, right? So this was exciting for him. And, and so he's going to go down and he's going to hear the doctors tell them whether or not you're in remission or whether or not, hey, we're going to do more treatment. And the company that he's working for says, we're going to give you this huge promotion if you're well. So we went down there to either comfort him or to celebrate that is a weird feeling. We all drove down there from his place in Myrtle Beach down to Charleston, where it's 1,000 degrees every day. Uh, and we met with the doctors. The doctors came in, and they said, uh, you're in full remission. There's no more cancer. We have no reason to think it'll ever come back. So we praise God for it. Two minutes later, the company called him on the phone. No lie. Two minutes. We're sitting there in the doctor's office, still, still talking about it. They wanted to know, what was the verdict? He said, I'm in remission. Great. You got it. We'll talk to you soon. Celebration. It'd be very easy to walk away from that and say, oh, God is good, isn't he? Because that's the way we usually think. But what if something happened that was opposite? What if they said, it's not good news. You're going to need more treatment. We're not sure what the future is. And the company called and said, what was the verdict? And the verdict was reported. And they said, fine, you don't have a job here anymore. Is God still good? You see, this is the tension and the pressure that is what a Christian goes through. This is the types of scenarios that have been created in Job's life and in Paul's life and in Joseph's life, just to name a few. The question is, is God really good all the time? And our perspective on the goodness of God is absolutely critical to how we live our lives. In closing, I told you we'd go back to, to Genesis chapter three. And this, in a minute's time, will be wrapped up here. But I want you to see something here in Genesis chapter three. The Bible says that the serpent was more crafty than any, um, he's more crafter than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord uh, had made. And he said to the woman, indeed has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, uh, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you'll not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, you'll notice there that he says in there very specifically, you can't eat from this tree, 
you also can't do what? You're not even allowed to touch it, right? I mean, so when she walked over and pulled it down, it was game over, right? It was, it was game over. That was it. it was, it's immaterial now. Who eats what? Who took the first bite? What if, for kind of fruit? I mean, it's over. God said, you will surely die. Now, notice what Satan does. He's so subtle. He's so crafty. But what he does is he comes alongside of this woman and says that, well, you know, the reality is you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Oh, you mean right now my eyes are closed. How many of you would like to have your eyes closed? closed right now. I would, absolutely. It was never a good thing to have your eyes opened. It was never a good thing to know the difference of good and evil. When I get to heaven, when you get to heaven, guess what? We don't process good and evil because everything in heaven is good. Amen. Isn't that going to be wonderful? Can you imagine in the Garden of Eden, there is absolutely no good, and there's absolutely no evil, and there is no reason for you to need to know what evil is. That's why God said, don't eat of it, and don't touch it. How many times my mother told me, don't touch that. (laughs) Sometimes I listened. Oh, if Adam and Eve had listened. But do you see what Satan has done there so subtly? What he did was he pushed it into Eve's thinking that maybe God wasn't being good. So the goodness of God is a perspective through which all of life's experiences have to be viewed. And it's so essential that we see God as good all the time. Satan tries to paint a picture here in Genesis chapter 3 that, you know what, Uh, God's really not out for your benefit here. Your eyes are going to be opened. It's going to be fantastic. You're going to know the difference between good and evil. I don't think Eve even understood what evil was. But when she took that fruit, then she knew. And it's been downhill ever since, hasn't it? But you see what Satan was so clever in doing was changing her perspective of God. And he was able then to persuade her to disobey God by eating the forbidden fruit. When you and I go through problems in this life, when the, when the pressures of this life, and if they haven't come yet, folks, listen, they're coming. When these pressures bear down on us, when we are in a point of saying, okay, now my faith is really being tested, If your perspective is altered in any way where you do not see God as being good, 100% good, 100% of the time, you will be severely tempted to sin against him. You will be severely tempted to blame him, to argue with him, to walk away from him. This is why when we look at the power of God and we look at the goodness of God, even though things like Katrina have happened in our world, God is still good. The problem is with man's perspective, you see. You see, death and the consequences of that sin came into the world and has changed this world from its original form. And we experience the consequences of sin every day. Whether it's a loved one who's gone on, we experience the consequence of Genesis chapter three. Whether it's people who are terrorists who are seeking to take life, whether it's storms that take life, whether it's You name it, we live in a fallen world, but God has given to us a reason for hope, and he's demonstrated his goodness to us through the person of Jesus Christ. And the reality that we can have eternal life and live forever in a place that knows no evil is all because God is good. God is good, amen. Regardless of the circumstances of life, no matter what you're going through, uh, maybe you're here this morning in this service and, and you're looking at cancer surgery or you're looking at some other type of hurdle that's before you. You and I need to remember that God is good. 
God is good. The second, before I take my last breath and go into the presence of the Lord, know this, that God is good. He truly is. This is who our God is. Let's pray. Please stand with me as we as we close in prayer. Let me encourage you today that if you are unsure about where your eternal destination is, that you will, as the psalmist wrote, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. May you come to find the goodness of God through salvation in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And if you're challenged as a believer, I pray that you'll talk with the Lord and have that biblical perspective of the goodness of God. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love to us. We thank you, Father, that you have made it possible for us to come into your presence, and that is only through Jesus the Christ. Oh, how wicked this world was when Jesus Christ came. How needy it's always been and is today to put the Savior of the world to death perfect in all things, perfect in all ways, holy and righteous, to put him on the cross and allow him to die there. Father, we thank you for your goodness because you allowed that to happen so that we might come to faith in Jesus because truly he has come forth from the grave. The resurrection proves that he canceled the power of sin. And what a joy it is and a blessing now to be children of the Most High. Work in our hearts and our minds, Lord, I pray. Help us, Father, to have the right perspective, that we might be trusting you in days full of joy and days full of sorrow and everything in between, that we might bring you the glory you deserve. And I pray this all in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. Have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend.